Welcome to Crime Watch UK. We're live. We're waiting for your call. First, the gang who set out to steal on Halloween and ended up committing murder. Roger Gates has lived in this farmhouse for over 50 years, but the area has become part of the suburbs, and he and his wife, Chirito, are renting out their land as a lorry park. The American government's been trying to reassure voters they'll be safe from terrorists when they go to the polls on Tuesday. The head of Homeland... Chirito was with me for 13 years. Our plans were to uh, get married next year to April. We were going to build up the business and consolidate it, tidy up buildings, improve buildings. I just been looking at that back field, you know. We should consider perhaps letting it out next year. In other words, we had plans for the future all the time. Yeah, good idea. Mm. We'd have to have a larger sign, though. Chirita was, generous to a fault, exceedingly kind in everything she did. Very good, very kind. Everybody loved her. A passerby was at the back of the farm in Horseshoe Crescent, where a metal fence surrounds the lorry park. Thinking when we do the new conservatory. By five o'clock three weeks ago, it was already dark. And then I could have my pot plants in the way around. What the hell do they want? What can I do for you, boys? Can you give us a key for the gate? Well, the drivers all have a key. We've lost ours. Sorry, can't help. Well, did you recognize anything? I've never seen it before in my life. I didn't like the look of them. They were shifty. What's that? How they've broken the gates. Well, I'm not having this. I'm waiting till they come back. <laughs> Slow down! Slow down! Slow down! was a brutal, cowardly act. There was no way she would have got out of there. He simply drove straight at her. The great proportion of the building was smashed into and it was jammed. Horrendous thing to do. Merciless. The cruelty of that is beyond belief. You killed my wife! The world's short of nice people. They leave very valuable ripples about other people, people that leave kindness. You can't afford to lose them. Nobody can. This is DCI Dave Cobb. Uh, Dave, she was incredibly brave, wasn't she, to try and stop that lorry? Yes, a very, very did. brave lady. And what she was doing that evening was acting upon her instincts, really, to do what she thought was right in trying to get that barrier down and stop that gang from stealing the lorry and the valuable load they had with it as well. What can you tell us about the gang? What do they look like? Well, there's some good details there. The first man, who was the driver of the lorry, over six foot tall, he's a white male, although his complexion is described as quite dark. That may be a stubble. It may be grubbiness, or it may be because it was dark at that time of night. He's wearing distinctive blue or black tracksuit bottoms with a white stripe, and he smokes. He was seen to be smoking. Um, I mean, it's worth man... pointing out that when you look at the EFIT today, he doesn't look particularly like the actual reconstruction, but the EFIT is the thing that people should look That's at. That's right, the EFIT is people... And what about the other two? The man that was with him, he was somewhat shorter, about the same age, 30 to 40 years old. Fairly nondescript clothing, light brown clothing, but he had an accent that was described as either Irish or from the travelling community. The third man was only seen very briefly, 
all we can say about him was that he's much younger than the other two. And it's worth pointing out, isn't it, in terms of clues as to who these people might be, that they obviously knew how to, to handle that kind of equipment, heavy, heavy digging machinery, the lorry. That's right. That's what I'm asking people to do tonight. Put together all the factors here. Someone that matches those descriptions, someone that knows where North Holt is in the northwest London area. But most importantly, someone that could drive plant hire equipment, heavy diggers, heavy lorries, and manoeuvre them around as they did. And what about the Mercedes that we saw? The Mercedes speeds round to the front of the farm just afterwards. It actually takes a fairly crude three-point turn where there's some temporary traffic lights, which is where the A40 passes over Kensington Road. Um, now, that was seen by some people, and it was done with disregard to the other motorists. So I'm sure other drivers saw that. It then collects the driver from the lorry, and it speeds off. I'm obviously keen to trace that Mercedes. It's silver. It's in very good condition. It's a four-door saloon, possibly an E-Class. And there's something about the headlights in that they're described as... as, um, as there's frog eye headlights, which means that there's two separate lights on each side of the bonnet, which is a design that Mercedes had between one and five years old. OK, well, there's a reward of £25,000 for information needed the conviction of one or more of the gang. Roger's life has been shattered by Charita's death. If you have any information on the identity of these men, if you can put all those clues together, call all 500 600 600 or ring the instant room in Hendon on 020 8358 0200. Still to come, the night which began with an 81st birthday and ended up in violence. Thank you so much. Bye, see you later. The Christmas time rape of a child in Mansfield. How people in Leeds might help catch a gruesome killer. And who made off with 26 of these? We have some truly excellent progress to report from our last two programmes, all of it thanks to Crime Watch viewers. Last Hello month, there. we asked for help to identify <laughs> two men after an attempted burglary in Chester. Donald Stewart was arrested on the night of the programme, and his cousin, James McPherson, handed himself in the following week. Both have been charged with two counts of attempted burglary. Newport in Gwent now, where there was CCTV of three girls involved in a really vicious attack on another girl. As a direct result of 50 calls to Crime Watch, including relatives of those named, three women and a man have been charged with violent disorder and attempted grievous bodily harm. Progress on the death of Dawn Bassera, a mother of two who was knocked over in a hit and run in Tottenham, North London, a year ago. Last month we appealed for information. Two men have since been helping the police with their inquiries. Progress too from the September programme on the violent disorder in Croydon in Surrey. That was after England's Euro 2004 defeat by Portugal. We wanted to identify 12 men thought to be involved in the violence. We can't show you their pictures tonight because they're now the subject of police inquiries. A flood of calls came in after the programme and four people were arrested and charged with violent disorder. The remaining eight have been identified independently of Crime Watch and more arrests will follow. Progress now on the murder of the French student, Emily Delagrange, in Twickenham last August. You might have seen quite a bit of this in the papers yesterday and today. It's independent of crime. Much a man has been arrested on suspicion of her murder and also the attempted murder and robbery of a 26-year-old woman near Twickenham in November 2002. And now a request for a witness. Two months ago, we appealed about the murder of a BBC employee, Tom Brown. He was stabbed in Southgate in North London. Detectives have now issued this EFIT of a man they want to trace. He was seen in the area shortly before Tom's death. That's the early hours of Saturday, the 21st of August. He's described as late 20s, medium build, dark brown hair, and in a tracksuit with a hood. He was seen with a woman in Southgate High Street near the bus stop where Tom was found. The couple seemed to be having an argument. Who was the woman? She's described as white, five foot four, late twenties, slim and with shoulder length, curly black hair. If you can identify either of them, if you can help, call 0500 600 600. Out of the blue, a crime on an estate which has never known anything like it. It was obviously pretty well planned in as much as the attack has had balaclavas, but the target, an 81 year old woman, seems utterly random. Celebrating my 81st birthday. 
who was having a sing song in the pub and was really, really happy. Are you getting tired? <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to get some clothes. Good night, Mum. Good night, dear. Don't forget I'm coming tomorrow to take you to Richard. I won't. Signing the treaty that will bring into force the new EU constitution. This was a suspected safe house where it sought foreign fighters and. Give me all your money! I don't have any money! Liar! I have money in don't give me that! Show me where it is! No, Go on, show no me! Money here. Show me! It's Come on! All my money's in the bed, take it! What are you doing? There's not enough! No! Oh, oh, no! And he pushed me back three or four times in my chair. Oh, I don't know, well, I couldn't move. I was paralysed for a few minutes. And then when he hit me, everything went black. No, go, Let's go! I saw the light, and I just opened the door and ran off. I could, that could have killed me. All of a sudden, I felt as if my nose had bursted, and a cut, I could feel the cut as he punched me, so he must have had a ring on. And the blood was everywhere, all over me frame, all over the floor. Oh, my goodness. <coughs> the next morning, my eyes were like two blood blisters and the bruises on my head. I couldn't tell you how my head ached. And I'd bang the reds together. Picking on old woman. They can't have no parents of their own. That's what I'd like to do. Just get them and bang the reds together. If I've got the strength. <laughs> well, she's a very plucky lady, isn't she? But uh, this is D.I. Ron Warbank, and I would have thought with very little to start this case with. Uh, well, we do have information that we're appealing for at the moment. Uh, obviously, the incident occurred at about 3.30 in the morning uh, near Smithwick High Street. Two men dressed in dark clothing, possibly a vehicle in the area, possible someone seeing them. Uh, and so obviously we're appealing for witnesses to come forward and anyone that was in the area at that particular point in time. This is early on a Saturday morning, it's about three weeks ago. Yes, sir, Saturday morning, yes. It's Medic Centre. And it's the sort of crime which, I mean, it's so appalling. I mean, as you know, if, if these guys are caught when they go to prison, they're the sort of guys that are going to be called nonces for beating up an 81-year-old woman. Well, it's a particularly vicious crime against a very uh, vulnerable victim. Um, I'm sure that most of the uh, viewers this evening will have either relatives or people that they know who are in a similar position to Sally, who are actually uh, living alone and fending for themselves. Um, I'd appeal to anyone, including members of the criminal fraternity, to come forward and give any information at all that they can do uh, in order to apprehend the, uh, the person who's carried out this uh, awful crime, really. Well, bear in mind whoever did it. I mean, the, the, the violence was almost right from the start and, and vicious. I mean, it seems unlikely he's behaved like an angel up to then. I mean, people might recognise someone from that sort of very fiery temperament and, or it, attacking elderly people. Sorry? Well, that is a possibility, as you say. The, uh, the level of violence was uh, started almost immediately. There was no build-up at all. Um, it was aimed at a particularly vulnerable victim. But the other guy didn't take much part in the violence, if any? No, the, the other person uh, is literally held uh, Sally's arm uh, and the, the main Sorry? offender has... Uh, punched her about the, the face. I would even appeal to the person who's uh, taken the minor part in the offence to come forward and give us help if that's possible. All right, well, surely nobody would okay, want to protect name, the guy, the main guy who really battered her. A number's on the screen, or you can yes, call the incident room. There are uh, colleagues of Ron's there. That's in Smethwick on 0121 9079. Harry Simcox was 10 years old when he was killed in a traffic hit and run near Thruxton in Wiltshire three months ago. His father was critically injured. Tonight, help catch the lorry driver who's responsible. This is Harry's mother, Jo Flanders, his stepmother, Deb Simcox, and leading the inquiries, Inspector David Watkins. David, first of all, just tell us what happened. 
Yes, what we know at the moment is that just before two o'clock in the afternoon of Tuesday the 31st of August this year, that's the day before the bank, day after, sorry, the bank holiday, um, a silver Peugeot 306 being driven by Harry's dad who was driving on the A303 between Andover and Salisbury. When it reached the area of the uh, Thruxton motor racing circuit, it was in lane two of that, which is a dual carriageway, that road, which is a dual carriageway. A lorry moved out from lane one, and we believe that lorry struck the rear near side of the Peugeot, causing it to spin across the carriageway and strike the rear of a lorry which was parked in the, ca in the lay-by. Sadly and tragically, as a result of that crash, young Harry died, and his father, Paul, was seriously injured. Now, certainly when you look at the car, it's, it's, it's a, a terrible mess. I mean, there's no question, is there, that the lorry driver could have known what happened? No, we, we, we know, we're happy that the lorry driver knew the crash had occurred. It was seen, the lorry, after the impact, was seen swerving up the road as if the driver had lost control. The lorry was then seen, once it regained control, the lorry was seen driving off at the next exit, which is a junction with the A338. Now, the A338 is a road that leads between the A303 and up to Marlborough through the villages of Tidworth. There is a possibility that it may well have turned back onto the A303, back past the scene of the crash, to see what had happened. Okay, well, Joseph, because a lovely picture we've got of Harry here. He was just 10 years old. Tell us a little bit about him. I think Harry was one of those people who, from the moment he woke up in the morning, he smiled. Um, I think his mission in life was to make people happy. He always had jokes to tell, stories to tell, or just, would just simply fool around just to make people happy and to cheer people up. He was just a very jolly little boy. Very. he just started at a new school. He was settling in really, really well, making lots of new friends and doing really well at school. Okay, well, well Debs, what about Harry's dad? Paul, what situation is he in now? Well, Paul suffered um, a severe head injury as a result of the crash. Um, he's making a recovery, but he's got some damage to his brain and we're not just not sure what long-term impact that's going to have. Um, he's found it very difficult to deal with Harry's death and obviously, you know, that whole period of his life he can't remember and uh, he is struggling with it. Well, Dave, this has had a devastating impact, this crash, as we can see from, from Joe and Debs here. In terms of the lorry itself, what clues have you got that viewers can help with tonight in terms of identifying the lorry and the lorry driver? We've spoken to a number of witnesses and uh, they've identified the lorry as being a large lorry, so a large goods vehicle, with a blue um, area, the blue... Now, blue sides. Blue sides at the back, blue, sorry, blue sides and the blue back. Um, we're not sure of the colour of the cab at this stage, but we believe it's probably a different colour to the, um, to the loading area. And what about the registration plate? There's, there's some indications about that too. Yes, yeah, so originally we thought um, the vehicle may well be a, um, a foreign registered vehicle. Um, one was seen in the area at the time of the crash, and we're still trying to trace that vehicle. But we're not saying that was the one involved in the and crash. And what about the lettering on the registration plate? Now, that, uh, the rear registration plate on that was coloured white, uh, with a red surround around the outside. Um, and that had black letters inside, black letters on the number plate, spelling out the letters A, L, and then a sort of... Um, so there's some kind of symbol, wasn't Yeah, there, symbol right? of some kind, and another L, L, E, N. Um, so we're looking for that vehicle at so the what, moment. So what, foreign registration plate? Yeah, Presumably. we believe it's a foreign registration plate, and we're linking in with our colleagues abroad. I've got an intelligence unit, we're linking in with our colleagues abroad to see if we can identify that vehicle or some, something similar to that. So presumably if there are any transport managers who think that that might, that might ring a bell with them, they might have had some kind of connection with that lorry. You want them to call tonight, certainly. Yes, I do. Also, I believe that uh, the driver of this vehicle, I say, I think he would have known about the crash. And if he'd known the consequence of the crash, I would suspect they would have returned back to their base quite shocked and they'd behaving different, they'd be, their behaviour would be different to what it would normally be. And I would ask for any person in the transport industry, or anybody connected with the transport industry, to contact us if they, if they recognise those signs in their drivers or if they believe that their driver was involved in this crash, particularly if they were on the A303 at that time. And what about witnesses? I mean, there's, there's one in particular, isn't there, someone who was driving a white van? That's correct. A white van stopped at the scene of the crash immediately afterwards. Um, one of the occupants got out, went back to the car and then got back in the van and the van then drove off. Um, we'd like to trace that vehicle and uh, speak to the occupants of it. And then of course anyone who may have seen anything, I mean we don't know this particular lorry was involved uh, with this particular uh, lettering, but anyone who may have seen the lorry or anything around the area at that time? That's correct. The A303 is a very, very busy road and at that time of day um, and that time of year it was actually the day of the Dorset Steam Fair, so it was particularly busy. Um, 
We've identified some witnesses, but what I would like to do is build up a picture of all those people using the westbound A303 between 1.30 and 2 o'clock. And I would ask anybody using the carriageway at those times to contact me, please. Okay, well, Joe or Debs, I mean, if, if, if there are people out there and they're perhaps hesitating about calling, what would you say to them? I, th I think that it's, um, it's very important for us, both of our families, that we can move on with this. Um, and we can't do that until we get some information through. So really for both of our sakes and, you know, for Paul and for um, Chris, Joe's husband, please give us some information, ring up if you know anything at all, and please help us to move on with our lives. Okay, well, look, Harry was only 10 years old. If you were that lorry driver, please call us. If you can help in any way, the number is, as always, 0500 600 600, or there's the Operation Rufford Incident Room in Hampshire on 0845 045 4545. Now here's DC Jackie Haynes and DC Rav Wilding. Well, we've six faces for you now. They're all wanted for serious crimes throughout the UK. Tell us where they are. We're looking for Marcus Wayne in connection with the murder of Timothy McPherson in Oldham in July. He travelled to London after the murder and was living in Wood Green until two months ago. Now I now have information that he's calling himself Tony and is with another man known as Drew. They're befriending students in North London. Marcus Wayne is fluent in German and has a sociology degree, which is something he may well bring up in conversation. John Blackstock escaped from prison while serving three and a half years for stealing high-value cars. He's now wanted for a series of similar offences. He befriends car dealers, sometimes dressing as a police officer or posing as a marine. He was last seen in Paisley near Glasgow in August. John Blackstock is 46, he has a Glaswegian accent and tends to use false names. Incidentally, he's a diabetic and almost certainly receiving medical treatment, so watch out if you're a doctor or nurse. Wayne Richards is wanted for the murder of Mark Johnson, who was stabbed to death in April in a McDonald's car park in Birmingham. Wayne Richards is 28 and has an S-shaped scar on his right arm. As you can see, he used to have a moustache. He's often called Way a Payne or Wayne Payne. He has affiliations with gangs in Handsworth and is considered to be extremely dangerous. This is Carlos Sanchez Coronado, but he may well be using different names. He's a member of the South American Drugs Cartel and he's wanted for money laundering and for bringing huge amounts of cocaine into Britain. He's 38, stocky, and has connections in Kentish Town and Stamford Hill, North London. We're also looking for Russell Mohammed in connection with the rape of a woman in Telford. Mohammed is an Iraqi Kurd but has been living here for four years, moving between Croydon and Wolverhampton. He's also worked at a number of factories in Telford. He may now be living in Maidstone, Kent, but wherever he is, we really need to find him. Richard Osborne is wanted for possession of firearms, including a Scorpion machine gun, which is capable of firing more than 15 rounds a second. He comes from northwest London, but has connections in Bristol and the Midlands. He's 22, and he's known as Richie Boo. 0500 600 600, if you can help with any of these cases. To Yorkshire now, and our next appeal is a most of all, a viewers in Leeds. Tonight, the gruesome find at a West Yorkshire beauty spot. Police now say it's a murder hunt. Lindsay Bourne's leg is so far the only part of her body to be found by police searching Woodhouse Ridge. The 28-year-old prostitute hadn't been reported missing, and until now there seemed few clues as to what had happened to her. This is Sovereign Street, just outside the centre of Leeds. By day, a busy business area. During the evening, the, the scene changes and becomes more or less the centre of the red light districts of the centre of Leeds. This is where Lindsay came. She was dropped off about 11, 11.30 on Thursday, the 9th of September. The arrangement was that she'd go to work. She'd meet her friends again at this telephone box 3 a.m. the next morning. She never made that meeting. Take care. Yeah. See you later. Bye. The most likely thing we feel is that she was propositioned by a client in a car and she was taken away from here and we've never seen her again. Detectives were alerted after dog walkers found human bones buried in a wood just outside Leeds. This is an area known as Woodhouse Ridge. A month to the day after Lindsay went missing from Sovereign Street, a local man walking his dog discovered what proved to be the lower half of Lindsay's leg. 
The questions that we have to address now are who took Lindsay from Sovereign Street? Hi. What vehicle was involved? Where did she go? Where has she been? Where was she murdered? Where did the dismemberment take place? How and when were the two parts of her leg brought to where we are now? Well, a little earlier this evening, I spoke to Lindsay's mother, Karen Pawson. Karen, for any parent to have a child killed is almost inconceivable. Um, the circumstances of this are absolutely appalling for you. But perhaps what makes it worse is there's just so little to go on. What are you, in your heart, what are you hoping to find out? What do you want to know? I wanted to know what happened to Lindsay, if she suffered at all. Um, what, where a body is, what's happened to a body, and we just want a body back. Tell us a bit about, I mean, she got into drugs, and up to that point, I've been a perfectly normal little girl, perfectly happy at home. She, yes, she's just went through the normal teenage tantrums, I suppose. And um, how did she get into drugs? I think it's just the teenage culture, really. She was, <coughs> she was going dancing to rave dances, and she got into drugs. Um, she said it was speed that she first took, and we thought we'd. We got her sorted when she told us about it. We thought we got her sorted out with that. Um, but then obviously she started taking drugs again. And I think that's what led to the prostitution and then to a murder. What effect has, has this had on the rest of the family? Oh, a devastating effect. Um, we can't sleep on a night time. We just wake up every couple of hours, nightmares, wondering where she is, what's happened to her. Just think about parts of her body being buried that they found and where's the rest of her? You know, where is she? Just want to have her back. Well, let's hope someone tonight can help. Let's see if you can help with this. Um, Professor Chris Milroy is the forensic pathologist investigating Lindsay's murder. Fairly gruesome business you're in, engaged in, but absolutely critical to this. Nothing but a leg. Now, what have you been able to ascertain from that? Well, from scientific tests, we know this is actually uh, Lindsay's leg. So you've absolutely proved that conclusively? Yes. We've also um, been able to show that it was dismembered from the rest of her corpse. In other words, she, she was definitely dead, thank heavens, b before she was dismembered. There's no yes, question of that. Yes, and um, she almost certainly was killed um, within a short time of her disappearance. OK. And so that's, that's uh, what, Thursday the, the 9th? She was last seen, I think. Thursday, so we're, we're talking about Thursday the 9th of September until, what, the 10th or 11th? She was certainly dead by then. Uh, something of that, is of that order. The place where the body uh, part was found would indicate that this, this man uh, it, it is, is happy to be in that area. He knows that area. But, of course, we've only found the leg, and there are possibly five or six other dump sites within a three-mile radius. You think research shows that somebody who would do this would take the body into several bits and, and scatter them? That's right. It will dump them in more than one site. So what we want to know is, has anyone smelt anything foul uh, since that time? Has anybody f found bloodstains in a house that shouldn't have been there? Have the man that they know washed their clothing? Have they burnt anything? Have they um, behaved oddly, gone out at odd times. Would, th would this be somebody who's got specialist knowledge, uh, as you as a, as a pathologist, as, as a doctor, or is yes. this fairly crude? There's nothing to indicate this person has any specialist skill, such as a, a doctor or a butcher or a chef. This but it is somebody you're fairly confident in Leeds? Yes. They would know would the, the, the place where the, the body was parts okay, were found. And, and, and probably have dumped other bits within a three-mile radius. You know, please help catch this man. Uh, Given the nature of this crime, it's really frightening the idea he might do something like this again. Uh, if you were a client of Lindsay's, incidentally, we promise confidentiality if you call us here. If you know anything at all, our number is on the screen. The instant room in Leeds is uh, another free phone number. That's 0500 040 999. And there are other officers there waiting for your call. 
Over the last year, 15 armed robberies have taken place at Aldi and Lidl supermarkets across the West Midlands. This is DCI Derek Mason. We're talking about 15 armed robberies here, and, and you're certain, aren't you, they've all been committed by the same group of people? Yes, we are sure that they have been committed by the same people. We've got quite a bit of video evidence that shows these offenders. Well, let's take a look at CCTV, because now, now just tell us what we can see here, Derek. Right, we can see the two workers coming into the store, followed by the three offenders who we believe to be Asian with Midland accents. Midlands, that's of course, you can't really see much about them otherwise, can you? Because they've got balaclavas on, haven't they? Yes, they wear masks at all times when they commit these offences of robberies. Now, the frightening thing is, of course, that the, they're armed, aren't they? It's only one of them's got a gun. Yes, whenever they commit these robberies, they have a handgun, they threaten staff with it. Here again, we can, you can see, see it gleaming there, can't as they, you? Yeah. they hold it to a member of staff's head and march them through the store. Here's one of the offenders marching through the store, as you can see, all masked up, but wearing what we believe is quite distinctive clothing. And what is it they're after? Is it cash they're trying to get? Yes, um, they're after the cash from the safe in these stores, um, stealing approximately £2,000. Here you can see them marching a member of staff down into well, the terrifying store. Terrifying for that member of staff. Oh, yes, definitely terrifying. Verbal threats, obviously the threats with the firearm as well. And what time of day are we talking about here? Right, they're going out at 5 of 30 in the morning up to 8 o'clock, so they're very early in the morning. They're out committing these offences at Aldi and Little And stores. this is the car that they always use, isn't it? It's a Citroen Saxo, a black Citroen Saxo. Yeah, it's a black Citroen Saxo, VTR or VTS, where they use false plates on the vehicle. We believe that it's either their vehicle or they've got easy access to such a vehicle. Because this is the one they always use. They always use this black Citroen Saxo to commit these offences. Now, we haven't got a lot to go in terms of what they, they look like, but one of them was wearing a very distinctive Nike top, so we can have a look at that, can't we? Yes. The night top, as you can see, it's got a black body with grey sleeves and hood, and on the back there is the word Nike with a night tick. It is quite a distinctive top that the offender wears. OK, well, let's see what uh, our viewers can help with tonight. There's a reward, certainly, of £5,000 from Aldi supermarkets leading to the conviction of any of these men. And don't forget, in many cases, they've been violent towards the supermarket staff. They've even threatened to shoot them. You saw them with a gun there. Help put a stop to them before they seriously hurt someone. Call us in the studio on 0500 600 600 or the instant room in Birmingham on 0121 200 2552. Now here's Jack in Rav with uh, the latest on tonight's yes. call so far. Yes. Well, I've been taking particular interest in the calls coming in on the Charita Gates here. murder in North Holt, North London. Um, we saw yes. three suspects and a silver E-Class Mercedes involved in that crashing of the lorry in such a terrible way. Okay. But Does I'm particularly interested in callers who can um, t cast light on who can drive okay. these heavy plant machines that they were trying to steal. Three mechanical diggers were stolen. Were they stolen to order for someone in particular? And that's a very unusual thing to steal. If you can shed some light on that, I'm sure the officers here would be very grateful. Rav, how have you been doing tonight? Well, I've just been talking to my colleagues here about that brutal attack up in Smethwick on Sally Skidmore. And we've had lots of calls coming in, but in particular we had one call that a viewer said they heard from someone else that they'd confessed to the attack encouraging stuff. But to reassure those viewers that were a bit concerned, saying, well, if we don't know the identity of the offenders or even a description, how can they help? Well, we do know there was two of them. We do know one wore a black three-quarter length jacket and the other a black bomber jacket. We know it happened very early in the morning, between about 3.30 and 3.45. There's absolutely no excuse for this level of violence. So if you do know anything about it, you must give us a call. The studio number's on the screen, and if you're watching on digital satellite TV, you can email us directly through your remote control. Just press the red button and choose Crime Watch. It's not yet uh, 25 to 10. We're getting some really cracking calls in. Um, it's going to be Christmas, of course, next month, which makes it a good time now for a seasonal appeal aimed at people who live at Mansfield in Nottinghamshire. I'm going to ask you to think back to last Christmas and whether you had a relative to stay on Sunday the 28th of December. Three days after Christmas, and he must be white, in his early 20s, slim, around 5 foot 11 tall, with short, dark brown hair. And back then, a year ago, he'd have owned a pair of royal blue tracksuit bottoms and a navy blue top. Now, if you know somebody like that, well, you could help solve a really very brutal crime. And the officers here are waiting for your call. Molly, come on. Molly, get in the picture. Come on, love, there we go. All right, every smile. Mr. Dad, ready? And? Family Christmases are normally happy, we enjoy them. 
and we're all together. One, two, three, smile! Molly, I want you back in an hour for lunch. I'm not that hungry, Mum. Well, you will be when you've been out for a walk. OK, but I'm going to ask the others if they want to come as well. Well, that's all right, we'll just be back in an hour. Come on, then, James. Bye, see you later, have fun. OK, see you in a bit, bye. She's a very bubbly, happy-go-lucky girl. She enjoys school. She's got a, a big group that she does go out with and hang around with in and out of school, which is really nice. Oh, hi, Molly. Hi, is Claire there, please? No, she's not. She's gone to the cinema. Oh, OK, no worries. I'm just taking James for a walk. Oh, OK. Oh, well, I'll get her to call you. OK, thank oh, you. Bye. 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 Come on, James. On her way, she called for three more friends who have dogs, but no one was in. Basically, I was just walking father-in-law's dog, and as I walked down here with the dog through this through this hedge here, a gentleman appeared from the right-hand side. Um, he was very huddled up, looked cold, looked completely out of place. It's not a place you come at this time of the year without a dog. I was heading towards the woods, just over in front, in front of me over there. The person was probably three to four hundred yards in front of me. I, I think he turned around once and had a quick look, uh, but then he was—he was, he was just—he just his way. He was walking. If you're coming out for a stroll, you don't walk as quickly as he was walking. And then he went round uh, the path there into the clearing, and then as he got into the clearing, he speeded up, and that, that was the last I saw of him. The dog is definitely part of the family, and we've had him three years. And um, he loves her and she loves him. And she enjoys taking him out for walks. Uh, she's been gone for quite a while at some occasions, whether she called for friends or not. Gang after me, and the police are after me too. I said, Don't worry, I just need you to go into the woods with your dog just to see if they're in there. Shut that dog up! No, Brian. Come on, quickly. We need to walk faster. I need help quickly. What do you want? If everything's all right. I'm not going to let go of you, because you're going to scream. Oh, well, please don't hurt me. I promise I won't hurt you. How old are you? 30. Don't cry. <laughs> Shit, I think we need to get down here. Right, give me your jacket. What are you doing? What are you going to do to me? Get off me. <laughs> What are you gonna do? Just get on your knees! You see this? The girl was then raped. <laughs> Just keep looking at the wall. Please don't hurt me. Just keep looking at the wall. Please don't hurt me. It's affected everyone in different ways. Uh, it's affected them very deeply. You know, each, each one has different feelings about what happened. You know, everyone's very angry. Um, you know, and so is she. She's very strong, very strong girl. No woman or child, you know, would ever like that to happen. Um, and it is, it is your worst nightmare. However strong the girl, however strong the family, it's hard to conceive what they must have been going through. 
This is Diaz, Ash Wilson. He's got to find the man responsible. He must be wide. He's going to do it again. Um, what makes you think that he's a visitor to Mansfield, incidentally, rather, rather than uh, somebody who lives there? Dick Martin, uh, Nick Martin put a lot of effort into uh, local inquiries. These have almost been exhausted. We really do feel now that it may be someone from out of the area. Now, we gave a description earlier. We think he's early 20s, he's slim, clean-shaven, at least he was uh, a year ago. He talked a lot to the girl. Is that, was he just worried and nervous, or was that a characteristic, do you think? Have you anything to go on? This is rare. It's not very often that someone will talk that much yeah. or uh, for that length of time. This must be significant. Someone with a knife, of course. So someone who was staying in that area over the Christmas period uh, recognises the description of the possible attacker. What else is there? What about witnesses? Or uh, Have you really exhausted that? We spoke to a lot of local witnesses who were walking the dog in the area on that day. The significance is it's only three days after Christmas. It's the first Sunday after Christmas last year. Yeah, now to place it, it's by the local vets, isn't it? It's, it's quite a built-up area around there. It is. It's um, a very built-up area. A lot of uh, residential uh, housing in the area. But the place itself was actually very secluded. Yeah. Uh, where there was, uh, it, people have noticed in the reconstruction, when he took her into the, into the bushes, into the woods there, there was something yellow on the ground. What was that? We believe this is a fluorescent yellow paper boy or girl's bag that would be used to deliver papers of a morning. Um, we've not traced the origin of this bag, and we'd dearly like to. So you're concerned with somebody, anybody in the area, Mansford area, who has lost one, who dropped one, who put one there, or else is the possibility it was taken there by the rapist himself to sort of mark the area? We are examining the possibility that it's been placed at that uh, particular location as a marker by the attacker. OK. You think he probably knows the area anyway. That's why you, you think he was a, a Christmas visitor to the area rather than someone who was just there for, for the day. The attacker must have knowledge of that area. OK, if uh, someone matching that description was staying with you or uh, staying with someone you know last Christmas or has visited the area or ever came from the Mansfield area, give us a ring, please. No calls to Crime Watch are traced and, of course, you could pre prevent this happening to another child. 0500 600 600 or the Mansfield incident room is on 01623. 483925. And if you've been the victim of a crime or you would like to talk to somebody, you can always ring Victim Support Line on 0845 30 30 900. Now here's DC Rav Wilding. I've robbery, ransom and violence all for you this month. All of it's caught on camera. Give us the names of those responsible and even better, where we can find them tonight. First, Newquay, an armed robbery at a garage. This man is threatening a member of staff with a knife to get cash from the till. He's wearing a Philadelphia Eagles baseball hat, which isn't available in the shops in the UK. Do you know who he is? Kent next. This man is counting ransom money, which was given to him for the safe return of a rare BMW stolen a few days earlier. The owner of the car asked the man to come to his motel to collect the cash. Can you name him? Now, fraud in Newcastle upon Tyne. This man is shopping with a stolen credit card. In this store, he buys a camcorder. At a jewellers down the road, he's able to purchase a man's wristwatch. In total, he spent over £2,000 in two hours. Who is he? Central London now, and an assault on a bus passenger. A group of youths get on the N9 bus at Trafalgar Square and sit in various seats. Two of them are at the back of the lower deck. Others, seen here upstairs, threaten a man sitting next to them. When joined by the rest of the group, they assault him. And after he goes downstairs to escape, they follow and attack again. Do you recognise any of them?
And I'm after a rather stupid con man. Here he is after fraudulently buying a motorhome worth £30,000. The previous owner was so sorry to part with his home that he asked the buyer to pose with it for a photo. Given that the owner's been ripped off, it's a rather useful souvenir. Who's the crook? Give us a call 0500 600 600 if you can help us with any of our cases. Now, an incredible piece of CCTV that's only been, re been released today. We think it's so shocking that we can only show you part of it, but you're about to witness an attempted murder. The pictures aren't brilliant, but there are vivid clues. On a Wednesday night about a month ago, Charles Butler drove home, parking outside his home on Green Lane in Dagenham, Essex. Now we can see the CCTV and he's going to start walking from the bottom here towards his home. As you'll see is another man who's actually timed his walk to coincide with Charles arriving home. And he fires at him, chasing him round this car and off into the street. That must have been terrifying for Charles Butler, absolutely terrifying. Now I'd like to rerun this again so that you can see our gunman walking down the road. He's got a very distinctive walk, almost a swagger it's been described at. Perhaps you can recognise that as somebody you know who walks just like that. Really very distinctive. Now we're going to have a look at it from another angle. Um, we're not obviously showing any more of this footage because it is far too distressing. And uh, again, you can see Charles running away with that very distinctive man. Can you put together that walk with a very distinctive dark jacket which has white writing on the back? Perhaps that'll uh, pin him down. Now we think after that he went down, to, uh, he, we think the gunman got into a red car, possibly a Toyota hatchback, after the shooting. And we do have a partial registration number which includes an M and a P. So do you remember seeing anything like this on Green Lane on a Wednesday night five weeks ago? And was this the would-be killer earlier? Or perhaps you were the driver of the car that turned into Mr Butler's driveway an hour before and who got out? I think you can just see that there. Here he comes. Do you recognise that man? Now, the car was a 1995 silver or grey Ford Granada Cosworth. Now we need, most importantly, to find a motive. Charles Butler is married with children and though still alive, he hasn't regained consciousness. In fact, his injuries are so serious, this could well turn into a murder inquiry. If you can help, please call us here free in the studio on 0500 600 600. Or you can ring the incident room in Edmonton on 020 8345 4362. Now there's a £20,000 reward for information leading to an arrest and prosecution. Now a case from Operation Trident, that's the big team of detectives tackling gun crime in the black community. They know that someone from North London has been bragging about a murder three years ago, but they also know the killer got the wrong man. It's next week, OK? His victim was a likeable DJ with no enemies, who on the night he died had simply been handing out flyers for a friend's band. His name was Dwayne Bertrand. He was quite gentle, you know, and a quiet person. It's happening next week, OK? He wasn't that sort of um, person to get into fights or arguments or anything. That's Hammersmith, so same place next week. He actually lived, you know, for his, for his music. When he was about seven, he started saving his um, pocket money, you know, to buy records. He used to call himself um, Selector D. And then when he got older, you know, he changed to DJ Destiny. For the past few weeks, Dwayne had lent his car to a friend against whom someone had a grudge. You're buying? Yeah, I'm starving. <laughs> yeah, but you ain't going Dwayne and his friends went to Leicester Square to get a quick bite before heading home. I'm going to buy you a meal, Thank you. Thanks, Hi. Hi. How are you? October, three years ago in McDonald's in Leicester Square. If you were that friend or acquaintance, perhaps called Bertha, we're not sure, give us a call. Listen, I'm to go. All right then, take care. Nice to meet you. So how much people are we looking to come? Uh, I'm guessing if we can get 500, then, then we're doing well. Next towards Tottenham Court Road and out towards King's Cross to drop off one of his friends nearby. Dwayne didn't know it, but CCTV proves he was being followed. 
Five seconds behind him was a black VW Golf, and 30 seconds later, but catching up, was a 3 Series BMW. wasn't involved in anything. They just had a night out and he went to drop his friend at his home and, and he just sat there and his life was taken. Even now, I still don't believe it. I'm thinking, oh, he's gone somewhere, you know, and he'll be back. At least if someone is, is, is convicted, well then, you know, we can put it to rest because it's like three years now and here I am going over the same thing again, you know, and maybe next year and whatever. Every time, every year when the time comes around, it's, it comes back. Well, police have a strong suspect and quite a bit of evidence. All it needs is a bit more to tip the scales of justice. If you know who did it, give us a call. If you know who's shielding him or where he put the gun, let us know. What about that BMW? It was very distinctive. A black 3 Series with seven spoke alloys, a beige interior, and unusually three rear headrests. One call could make all the difference on this one. 0500 600 600. Now, this is DI Scott Wilson. And Scott, hearing Dwayne's mother there and seeing the pictures of him as a, a little boy, it's worth reiterating, isn't it, that there was absolutely no reason why Dwayne should have been targeted? That's absolutely correct. There's no reason at all he should have been targeted in this way, and we are certain it was a case of mistaken identity. And people have been talking about this in the community, have been bragging about it. That's correct. The weeks and months after the murder, we are aware that people were talking about it, and our appeal is directed at partners, ex-gang members, friends of those individuals, to come forward and tell us what you know about who committed this horrific crime. We saw the two cars on the CCTV there. There was the goal that was leading the way. What about the people in that Golf? Well, the thing is about the Golf is from CCTV images, we know the Golf had actually left by the time the fatal shots were fired by the occupant of the BMW. So again, our appeal is to the occupants of that Golf, come forward, because you could well be significant witnesses rather than suspects in this case. Come forward and speak to us. And the BMW, is that likely to have been stolen, do you think? We know it's not stolen. It will, checks have been done and it wasn't a lost or stolen vehicle and it has never been abandoned. So our thoughts are it's probably been a hire car or a lease car, which was then returned the day after or a week later with no suspicion at all. And the gunman in the car, what about a description? He's a black male, he's 21 years old, he's 5 foot 10 and he was wearing a Nike t-shirt with yellow around the collar and Nike in two inch letters across the front again in yellow and was wearing a hooded top. And there's a £10,000 reward on this. This case is, is what, three years old now? Yes. It, it, you're not going to let this go, are you? Well, that's it. Operation Trident has got a reputation for pursuing all unsolved murder cases because people's allegiances do change and people do come forward. And again, that's what we're asking for tonight, for someone to come forward in order we can conclude this case for, the, for Duane's family. Well, you've got strong evidence already. 0500 600 600, if you can help, or call the Instant Room in Hendon on 020 8733 4704. If you want to remain anonymous, you can call Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 one. Well, earlier we looked at these six faces and asked you to find them. They could have been anywhere across the UK, all wanted for very serious offences. We haven't had a lot of calls, but uh, what we have had could be quite positive. Um, there's been a number of sightings, as usual, but if you still know where they are, please keep calling in. There's plenty of lines here to, uh, and officers here to take your calls. There is one call I haven't mentioned, which uh, actually could provide a result for later on in the programme, and it's being made now just as we speak, so fingers crossed. All of these are names that have been put in as possibles for the Mansfield rapist, the guy who raped a, a, a young girl, a child, really. Um, obviously too early to say much about them, except that uh, one of them in particular is, is looking very interesting indeed. As far as the Sally Skidmore attacks, the 81-year-old who was attacked in her home, uh, two people have given the same name. They're com 
completely different people. We're confident of that, so that's obviously going to be checked out pretty soon. Um, as far as uh, Tom Brown is concerned, we've got one name on that. Harry Simcox got over 100 calls, in fact, well over, probably getting on for 150 now. The, a lot of people make a lot of suggestions, most of them coming to Spain, Germany or Austria. Remember, we were trying to identify a truck with particular markings on it, and several people said Germany and Austria have got very similar symbols to that, so that'll be looked into very quickly indeed. last month and made off with 26 of these and DI Paul Griffiths is on the trail of the culprits. Where were they taken from Paul? They were taken on Monday the 18th of October from an industrial unit in Pontypool in South Wales. Now we've got some of the uh, some of them here that they're pretty distinctive aren't they? Yes we've got they're all children's bikes we've got a, a ZD motorbike we had uh, 12 of those stolen we had nine mini bikes stolen and five quad bikes. They've all, or almost all of them, have got the dragon mark on them, haven't they? That's correct, yes. Yeah. Most of them have got this dragon mark, which is actually embossed in the casing of the machinery of the bike. So, obviously, that's what people should look out for. It's worth saying that uh, these are still being sold legitimately through legitimate dealers, but if, if um, someone is trying to, to, to flog the ones that were stolen, whereabouts are they likely to turn up? Well, with Christmas approaching, we're wondering whether they'll be sold through car boot sales or through newspaper adverts, so we'll be looking for any help in that sort of direction. And obviously you want to hear from anyone who's, who's been told about these maybe in the pub or, as you say, car boot sales, that kind of thing. Yes, that would help. OK, well, um, you can hardly miss them, can you? Further information about the bikes is on our website at bbc.co.uk slash crime. If you think you know where they are, our usual number's on the screen or call the Instant Room in Newport on 01633 one. Our phone lines are open until uh, midnight tonight and uh, from 7.30 in the morning until midnight tomorrow. Our next month's programme is in just three weeks' time on Tuesday the 14th December. We'll be back at 10.35 with the Crime Watch update. If you can't stay up uh, until then, uh, well, do remember the sort of serious crimes we feature, not so much the quag bikes, but the serious ones are very, very rare, so don't have nightmares. Please do sleep well. Good night. Good night. <laughs>